the red flag flying here. Hello, welcome to Socialist Think Tank. Uh, we are here with Laura Smith. Hello, Laura. Hi, nice to be here with you. Yeah, great to have you here. So I'm going to go straight into the first question that we always ask. What is socialism to you? Oh, gosh, what a big question. Eh? Um, so I guess it. I kind of split it up into different things uh, personally. So socialism for me, it was growing up in a family where it was talked about all the time. My granddad uh, was a Scottish miner and um, that obviously kind of his experience passed down through our family. So socialism was dished up for breakfast, lunch, dinner. It was all the time. And what was it? It was fairness. It was equality. It was about having an economy that worked for everybody. It was about the fact that this system is rigged and we needed to fight against it. It was about giving people the tools to be able to do that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, fundamentally, what is it to me? It's it's about a fairer society. Um, and I think, you know, it's we have to recognise that socialism is something that we're going to have to fight for because there is a huge um, push from the establishment they don't want us uh, anywhere near what they have currently they have at the moment they have a system that works for them and it doesn't work for the many and socialism is about making it work for the vast majority of people what you've said there i'm sure it resonate with a lot of people who consider themselves socialists but like Recently, we've seen people saying things that are completely different about socialism, as if socialism is dangerous. And is socialism, do you think socialism is dangerous? No, I think that obviously there's going to be a huge pushback from people um, who it's not in their interest for us to look for at a fairer society. So they're going to make sure that um, as much kind of uh, negativity is, is, is put forward as possible. Um, I always say this, like when you talk about socialism, it always kind of people will say, I'll oh, stop talking about a time of like the 70s when things were like this, and blah, blah, blah. We've never actually done it. We haven't done it. We haven't um, achieved those those kind of visions that we want to. And the actual the ideas that we have are so progressive. And in my mind, they are exactly what is needed if frankly this planet is going to survive um but yeah there's a there is a huge um invested interest in making sure that people are scared of it and let's be honest people are scared of things that are different and that's where we have failed to be honest as a movement because we have to accept that it's going to take an awful lot of time, energy, um, organisation to be able to get people to understand and to be on side with us. If we go out um, and say to people, do you believe in healthcare for all? Do you believe in education for all? Do you believe that everybody should be able to get a house? Do you believe that when the rugs pull from under somebody's feet that they should be able to have um, access to support? The vast majority of people are gonna say yes, um, but if you start talking about the economy and the fact that we want to change the way that that runs, that, that suddenly starts to trigger people. Um, and there's no reason for that. And what we need to do is put that effort and that energy into getting people to understand the fact that at the moment we have an economy that runs in the interest of a tiny minority of people. Um, and it's absolutely right that we should have an economy that works for everybody. What you've made me think of there is um, a lot of the time when I say oh, I'm socialist, I've got socialist values, people will say, like, kind of, they'll ask me to justify my socialism. And yet it's very, it's very rare for people to say, well, justify capitalism, justify why people would say, you know, it's absolutely fine to uh, have millions or billions even stored in the Cayman Islands and not paying yeah. your taxes. Why are people like so, so um, critical of socialism and yet uncritical of, um, of neoliberalism, do you think? 
I think it's purely because the information isn't out there for people. Um, it's not accessible for people. If you look at somebody like Philip Green, for example, who um, as soon as this whole, uh, his whole empire kind of goes, goes bust and you inevitably get people who are saying, well, you know, he was, he kind of fought his way up and he did everything he could and he made a huge success of his life and poor old Philip Green. Well, no, it's getting people to understand the fact that this guy ain't going to lose a penny. It is the people, the wealth creators who have put him in that position, sadly, who are the ones who are going to suffer. And people don't have access to that kind of information. And I think the whole problem that we have in this country is an, a lack of political education, a lack of access to truth. Um, I think actually when you start providing people with the facts, they are very much on board. If you look at what's happened during the last 12 months, as soon as you start telling people of the um, the reality of, of privatisation with things like Serco, then, you know, they are really, really pissed off with it, rightly so. And it's, um, but you have to give those facts to people. So when they understand that this isn't an NHS app, this isn't something that the NHS have endorsed. This is privatisation. It's most scummiest, actually, because this is just um, Tories and the establishment being able to feed their friends and get very wealthy off something that is so, um, so tragic and hideous. Um, when people get those facts, they do care. Of course they care. Uh, but it's getting that information to people. I have this kind of optimistic view that people are, you know, that we write them off, we write them off too soon. Um, we saw that very much with the kind of Brexit debate, uh, the kind of divide that happened. And I think, and where certainly the work that I've been doing, it's been about going and listening to people and their opinions and views. And one of the things that is, so clear to me is there is a huge huge breakdown in trust between politicians and ordinary people between the establishment and ordinary people and if we can get in there as the left and start telling people and talking to them and listening to them and explaining what's actually going on I actually think we're in a very powerful position because the system's broken isn't it absolutely absolutely broken it's disgusting who can defend it, really? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And the system is broken. And I think people do see that. And I think the more people see of contracts being dished out and and to to friends of the Conservative Party and so on. But like that, I think that'll uh, it'll dawn on people what is really happening. However, we have this almost very strange thing where we'll flip between two establishments. So you'll have the establishment Tory party who'll do what they do. And then in this time of crisis they've kind of looked to a lot of people have said oh actually that that centrist labor party kind of figure is is what we need at this time do mm. you think that is what we need do you think we no, need no absolutely not policy? <laughs> i mean like no. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even think that's like no offense but i don't think it's true <laughs> Um, because basically what I think has happened is that what we've seen over the last um, five, six years is people saying we want different to the status quo. Um, whether that's in Scotland with the push for independence, whether that's uh, the push for Brexit, it is the fact that our system and our economy has not worked for the vast majority of people and they want something different. They want change. They might not know what that looks like. And the failure that we've had um, and what makes me so cross is that we have had the right wing filling that void, saying that this is what needs to happen. But where's the left voice been offering something alternative? Um, so, no, I don't think people are craving sort of that you know your, your Tony Blair politics your new Labour politics I just don't believe it the fact is that since 2005 we have been losing votes in um, stronghold traditional stronghold Labour areas this isn't a new thing um, that trust has been breaking down people's 
uh, feelings towards the, what they see as the establishment. Um, and, and all of these things have been kind of, you know, it's, it, it's basically something that we should have been tackling long ago and offering something different. And the failure that we've had is being able to do that. And when we have actually done that, when we have offered an alternative, we've been under huge amounts of attack. Because obviously, if you're going to offer radical change, then somebody is going to suffer. Who are the people that are going to suffer? Well, it's the people who have been making an absolute fortune off the back of it, off the back of the oppression of millions and millions of people up and down this country across the globe. Do you think, I don't normally go into, into specific Labour Party things in, in these videos, but I'm going to... I'm not going to promise never to do it again, but um, <laughs> but I'm going to do it now. Now, do you think the Labour Party have put themselves in a really, really confused position with the public and sort of can be all things to all enemies? Because I'll give you a quick example here. Um, just after the election, I was out for a walk with with my little dog and, you know, I saw someone who I often see and um, he was saying, oh, well, we got rid of Phil Wilson, who was our yeah. Our MP for the Labour Party here. And um, and the person who said he was glad to have rid of him said he was glad to have rid of him because he was Corbyn's man. Now, he had no idea that Phil Wilson was definitely not mm-hmm. in the Corbyn camp. Do these like attacks within the Labour Party on people like Jeremy Corbyn, have that, has that had a really negative impact on how people view the party as a whole, do you think? We have to make sure and what we we should have done. And I say this as somebody who has supported Jeremy throughout and will continue to support Jeremy. Um, What we didn't do was build that public support that was necessary through deep rooted organizing, through political education, um, because quite frankly, as much as I like Jeremy, this isn't about Jeremy <laughs> for me. This is about socialism. And what they've managed to do is to try and turn it so that an idea, something of social justice, of all of these things that we want to see, which I've, I've obviously already highlighted, is associated with one person. And that's not what it was ever about. It's never been about that. This is about not about a press being able to attack one guy and just kind of, um, and that's what happened. Let's be completely frank. We've seen in 2017, we saw people, um, a huge amount of people turn out and vote. I got elected. Nobody was expecting me to get elected in, in crew and Nantwich. which a huge amount of people turned out and voted for very popular policies. Um, and then what we saw was the establishment say, oh my gosh, this guy almost got in. We need to put a stop to that. And we saw a huge, huge campaign of personal attacks against this, this person who it's completely unjustified, um, frankly. But it should never have been about one person. And I just wish that people would put their energy now into making sure that they educate and they organise um, around socialist politics, about the things that are needed in communities like yours and like mine that will change people's lives. That's what I'm interested in. That is that is all that it's about for me. I'm not, if, if I never earn another penny out of politics, I'm not bothered as long as the people in my community manage to see a better tomorrow. That's what it's always been about to me. I think you've really hit the nail on the head about people making it about personality rather than about ideas, because you can you can destroy a person, but you can't destroy an idea. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, Absolutely. Put, put the idea on the person, and and uh, you can win. And I think that's what people have been doing, as you as you rightly say. Um, so you've been doing like a lot of community engagement since the election, mm-hmm. and you've been speaking to people. Would you, like, throughout the country, haven't you? And uh, mainly yeah. in the north, though, is that right? Well, actually, like, it's been one of the really positive things of this uh, hideous experience of the last 12 months has been 
being able to connect with people across the country over um, Zoom and social media platforms. And I've, I've literally been able to go all over the place and talk to people in Scotland and in Wales and the south of England and across the board, you know, we've been everywhere. And with no holding back, the whole purpose was to actually go and listen to people, listen to what their experience was, and not just to listen to people who think the same as me, who are from the same political wing as me, um, but to go and hear the, the harsh truths of what everybody thinks. And that's what we did. And we listened to thousands and thousands of people. And it was incredible. And I have to say that it kind of, it got me through this year because what it quite clearly showed um, was that despite all of the attacks, despite all of the things that are thrown at us, there are thousands and thousands of people over the UK who want something different. And they might not agree on everything, but we have something, we have a desire to change what the future looks like. And what we have to not let happen is that that, um, that fire's put out. We can't let it happen. And I think that a lot of people will kind of say, oh, you know, and we're hearing it all the time. Well, people didn't want those kind of policies. That wasn't, that's why we lost in 2019. No, I, I just don't believe it. I, I absolutely do not believe it. I think people do want change. I think the, the problem that we had in 2019 was we had not organized enough. We hadn't put the effort in and selling those policies and getting people to understand where we were coming from. And we need to go back and do that work. It's not gonna be quick, it's not gonna be easy, but we have to do it because quite frankly, the, um, the whole future relies on it. Um, I find that we've been speaking to people locally. We've been doing county council selections lately. And the people who are being elected are the people who are doing all the work in the communities. And it's really funny because there's like that's what we really should be about, the people who are working for each other and working for their communities. Um, so, you know, that that is, I suppose... Um, where the direction that the Labour Party should probably be leading in, it should be going more grassroots. Is yeah, that something you would agree with? Yeah, I mean, I think community organising is key to this. I think it is something that is um, often not done very well. I think it's about going out and listening to what your community wants and what they need, um, working with the people who are involved in the community, listening to all of their experiences, understanding that people aren't going to be coming from the same place as you as well, necessarily at the start. Um, and you have to put the effort in to build those relationships. But at the same time, you can't just do community organising and it be a gesture of goodwill. The politics has to be key and there is no point going out and organizing um, charitable events in my opinion if you're not educating people to the reason why this is happening and actually I find it quite insulting um, <laughs> and people will disagree with me I'm sure um, but I find it quite insulting when uh, you know you're asked to donate for the food bank but I know damn well that some of those people who are volunteering at the food bank vote for the conservatives who then are putting through policy after policy which means that people are going to have to use the food bank I mean what's that about and I've got no time for hypocrisy so let's be honest about what it is I think that community organizing should go hand in hand with political campaigning otherwise it's totally pointless we might as well just, you know, have children in need and Red Nose Day and let's all donate tins for the rest of our lives. Don't get you anywhere, does it? Absolutely right. Couldn't agree more. Um, so you've you've been around the country, you've spoken to different people, you've done this virtually, haven't you, but uh, during, during lockdown. But a lot of what you you've been saying probably backs up your worldview. A lot of what you hear is it probably backs up what you already thought. Has there been anything that 
has it changed you listening to other people? Because I know certainly doing interviews yeah. like this, <laughs> I pick something up from everyone else. So is there anything that's changed for you? Yeah, definitely. I think one of the things that really hit me when I was doing this tour, and I was a primary school teacher before I became a uh, politician, and you kind of, you hear a lot about aspiration, don't you, when you're a teacher, about the aspiration of kids. And it was you, it was you, Paul, who said to me about the fact that um, it isn't about aspiration, it's about opportunity. And I I kind of already, I, I already knew this, that opportunity was cut off to my kids, that opportunity was cut off to me. But I think the way that you put it was just so eloquent and it was just so right. Um, and I've repeated it time and time again. And I think that's the message that I would say to people. We can talk about the language of aspiration. We can talk about the fact that we aspire for our kids to be able to have decent jobs and we aspire for them to be able to have access to education and to healthcare and all the rest of it. But what you said was absolutely spot on. It doesn't matter how much you aspire. If you haven't got that opportunity, you've got no chance. Now, people will say to me, because I'm somebody who didn't have, um, on paper, didn't have that opportunity, and I managed to end up in Parliament. All I would say is I was extremely lucky. I was extremely lucky. And there'll always be lucky people who managed to slip through and, you know, somehow managed to go against the tide and, and do it. It was nothing about, that wasn't about me. That was pure luck. And I think when you said that on the tour, I just thought, yeah, he's he's got it. He's absolutely nailed it, 100%. Uh, I didn't expect that and I wasn't fishing. So- no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but well, that, that means the world to me actually because it's something that i've thought for a very long time in teaching you're right aren't you well, you're people, right. would, people i think i remember like 10 years ago or so i remember um a head teacher of mine saying we've got to prepare people for jobs that don't exist yet um because in 10 years time uh 90 of the jobs will exist then won't exist now well working in tesco's existed then and work and it exists yeah. now and actually 80 yeah. percent of jobs that are done now existed 100 years ago yeah precisely so, so, i mean i uh one of the schools that i taught at i remember we got a fish tank put in in the reception and you couldn't get the kids away from it you could, just could not get them away from it because the fact is they hadn't even seen fish before you know, that's where we're starting at with some children. They haven't seen fish before. So that's how, how can you then tell them that they can go and get the world, you know, the world's your oyster. It's just ridiculous. It's an absolute disgrace. Nothing makes me angrier than that, actually. Nothing. And that's what will always drive me. That's what, no matter kind of where I am or what I'm doing or what role I play, I will not stop until that sort of shit stops because that's not fair. That is not fair. It's like the, it's like the X factor of, um, of the work world, you know, like, Oh, well, we'll let one or two people, you know, make that leap and they can join the upper echelons and they can, you know, they can get through, but actually most people end up exactly just falling out and not and not getting anything out of it and yeah. we need to create and then, more opportunity yeah and then not only that they can't get out of it and then they get judged for it <laughs> by our society you know what's that about you know if we're going to talk about the fact that people are kind of stuck in a rut let's look at why let's look at why history repeats itself it isn't their fault no way it's the fact of these bastards who want to keep everything for themselves yeah, it's like, you know, if, how many people become a CEO? You know, how many people even have that ambition to have to be no, a CEO? Because it's just it? unrealistic, isn't it? You know, yeah, you're, not gonna become, you're not going to own a company. Um, no. What did you think of the recent Daily Mail headlines of making a success of Brexit? One of the things was um, you could buy a second home. That was a way you could make a success. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I mean, like with Brexit, I'm just so so tired of it as everybody is because 
And I don't want to like bang on my drum here, but when I was in Parliament, I was making the case for the fact that what we needed to focus on was getting a socialist government and making sure that we respected the result of the referendum and we framed what leaving the EU looked like under a left wing socialist government. And let's be honest, let's have that honest debate about the EU and what it actually is. And we didn't. We didn't because what the Labour Party did was it clang, it just decided to like cling on to the status quo rather than offer people who had voted for some change an alternative. And we are where we are. Um, and we have to see what happens. You know, to, if I'm being completely honest with you, I kind of just spend most of my time tearing my hair out about it because it didn't have to be this way. We didn't have to have an... 80 seat majority Tory government um, who was obviously going to make Brexit work for them and for their friends and all the rest of it. There was an opportunity there and people were too, um, I don't know. Well, it's it's not even, it's not people's fault. We didn't sell that vision. Uh, it was the fault of the left. See, that's another thing about the left. We always own our mistakes and no one else tends to do that. Although, although um, there have been a few clangers over, over time when we uh, decided to take the whole Labour Party listen, to take the blame listen, for the financial you, crisis. Yeah, but if you, don't <laughs> own, if you don't own your mistakes, you don't learn, do you? And my God, if we need to learn, it's over Brexit and we need to make sure something like that doesn't happen again. And how do you stop that from happening again? It's through political education. Um, because if we had politically educated people over what leaving the European Union could actually look like, what being part of the European Union actually means, the fact that being European is nothing to do with supporting something, an institution that penalises people in the global south and actually having that kind of honest debate about what this looks like, then we could be in a completely different position. But we didn't, did we? So, hey, <laughs> we are where we are. <laughs> so after speaking to all these people that you've you've been around, I think you're probably uniquely qualified to, <laughs> to have an opinion on this, at least, because a lot of people put out an opinion and they'll say, I think this, and there's very little to back it up. But talking to so many people and listening to so many people as you have, Mm-hmm. must give you some kind of developed, real, really developed view of what people want. So what are your hopes for the future about the kind of selling that that socialist ideal to people and, and allowing people to feel like socialism, it actually fits in with their values as well? Because my impression is most people have at least a lot of socialist values. Yeah. Um, people want an economy that works for them. If you can provide something that is, um, you know, if you if you can get secure work for people, if you can have that redistribution of wealth so that that inequality is tackled, that people see, that makes them feel, let's be honest, you know, makes them feel like they cannot kind of, they give up, don't they? You see it. You see it, you know, you just think, well, God, I'm never going to be able to get that. And you hear about this incredible wealth that so-and-so has and they feel beaten down. If we can tackle that, if we can tackle the injustice of the way the economy runs, I think, um, you know, we're, we're on to a winner. But I think what really struck me is that one, people care, two, people want something different. And three, they have a lot of power. They have a lot of power. They have a lot of ideas. They've got it all there, but it's getting the leadership to be able to unleash that to, so they can put it into what's necessary to be able to demand that change. And we've seen, we have seen sparks of that in the last 12 months we have. Um, and what we need to make sure happens is that, we organize and we educate um, in our communities to make sure that people know that there is an alternative and there is an alternative if you fight as a collective 
and how do you fight as a collective where well, you get involved in community groups you get involved in your trade union uh, you make sure you are in a trade union my god if ever more you know there's no greater time to be in one um and just don't stand for it you know life is too short I can't get my head around why people will sit back and kind of let this stuff happen and not get cross about it um and I get it because a lot of my friends do that bless you know you know they do because they just think it's too hard I can't I can't I can't kind of get the headspace to do it but I just have this thing where you have to you've got to have to we need we we deserve better fight for it Inspired by what you've just said, um, I'm reminded of, of something uh, you'll have possibly have done this while, while you're a teacher. There was a lot of talk about leading from the middle and there was a lot of misunderstanding about what that, what that means. What you're doing is you're leading from the middle because you are, you are becoming a leader within a group of people. And I think that's what we all need to do. We need to show people that actually everyone can be, everyone can lead on this. Everyone's ideas are equally valid. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, like my journey into politics was I was always involved in politics on a local level, a family level, very much personally developed. But yeah, I was a primary school teacher. I was a school cuts campaigner, but it was never somebody who thought they'd end up in parliament. My God, if I can do it, anybody can do it in the sense if we get the organisation right. I know I said I was lucky, but if we get that organisation right, then there's no reason why other people can't do it. But I think, I don't know. I think there's a lot of reasons to be really depressed currently. Um, and I understand that people do and they feel like we're under attack. But I think there's a lot of grassroots uh, there's, that are starting to kind of like sow their seeds up and down the country. And let's just remember that we're in a much better place than we were um five six years ago there are people who want this they want this change now it's our job to go and convince people um that that is that's what's desperately needed I think we can do it but we have to have the leaders to go and do it I'd never say I'm leading for the middle though I'm always leading from the left <laughs> not the centre but like <laughs> leading from within anyway maybe that's a better term <laughs> Um, thank you so much for this, Laura. You've definitely right. inspired me. Um, it'd be lovely to see you back in Parliament one day. Um, Who knows? Who all knows? Other, all other people. All I'll say, like all I, but all I will say on that is Parliament isn't the be all and end all. No, there are so many pieces, so many pieces to the puzzle, and you're playing a key part of that. And it's, um, I just wish people would stop putting all of their energy into the people who were in Parliament and put it onto, you know, the grassroots. Couldn't end it better. Thank you so much. <laughs> Pleasure. We'll keep the red flag flying here.